Anyone who's used the internet to communicate with others over the past two decades has inevitably at some point run into trolls. These are people, if you can even call them that, who are out to ruin everyone's fun. They're obnoxious, annoying, live under bridges, and try to lure others into adverse reactions for the perverse fun of being a pain. However, trolling doesn't just take place on the web internet. In fact, throughout film history, directors have purposely annoyed their audiences, and we're going to look at some now. I'm Ben from What Culture, and here are 10 movies that blatantly troll the audience. Number 10. Troll The Rise of Harry Potter Jr. In addition to its so bad it's good infamy, Troll is also noticeable because the lead character, played by Noah Hathaway, is named Harry Potter Jr. And this was 11 years before J.K. Rowling released the first Harry Potter novel. As a result, the rights holders have the option to create a fantasy movie featuring a character named Harry Potter without violating copyright law, which is quite frankly utterly unbelievable. In July 2015, SC Films International announced that it would be making an animated Troll sequel titled Troll The Rise of Harry Potter Jr. with Patricia Arquette in a main voice role. Fans of Harry Potter, the Rowling one, are going to feel especially ripped off if they're tricked into thinking this is a movie about the son of their beloved wizard, so be careful, kids. Number 9. Stardust Memories Fans of Woody Allen comedy films and even some critics were unhappy with his switch from comedic to dramatic filmmaking. In 1980, Woody released Stardust Memories, a film in which he stars as a film director having a mental breakdown in part because fans and critics don't like the recent dramatic films and tell him that they prefer his earlier, funnier movies. The film portrays fans as overbearing, critics as clueless pseudo-intellectuals, and studio executives as ignorant meddlers. In short, everyone who doesn't like the director's recent dramatic movies are idiots. Regardless if it was intentional or not, his fans can sense the underlying insults. Number 8. Sucker Punch Some have argued that the whole concept of Sucker Punch was in fact to criticize how geek culture objectifies women and sexualizes violence against females. The women in the film are all prisoners of a mental asylum, much like female characters in geek media are often prisoners of male fans' fetishized expectations of them sort of. Furthermore, most of the male characters in the film are controlling sex-crazed slobs who view the female leads as sex objects who are better off lobotomized so they can't object to their desires. In fact, the Sucker Punch title can be explained as how people who thought the movie would just be about sexy women in tight costumes would feel once they actually saw it. Number 7. Citizen Kane How can a film considered one of the best ever made be an example of trolling? Orson Welles was just that good at baiting his audience that people actually applauded him for it. The plot of Citizen Kane is driven by a reporter trying to figure out what Charles Foster Kane's dying word, Rosebud, actually means. After discovering it was the name of his childhood sled, even the reporter in the movie concludes, I don't think any word can explain a man's life. Welles himself even dismissed Rosebud as just a gimmick to get the plot moving, and regretted that people saw the sled as a psychological key to Kane's entire life. They still felt satisfied with the revelation though, and praised him as a genius nonetheless. Number 6. Postal In 2007, German director and troll man Yui Boll reached what was perhaps peak irritation with Postal, another movie based on a video game. Postal included a subplot involving Osama Bin Laden and George W. Bush as best friends, offensive 9-11 jokes, Boll owning a Nazi-themed amusement park, and Vern Troyer being sexually assaulted by chimpanzees, all of which had nothing to do with the video game it was based on. On the DVD commentary for Postal, the director admits that he added all these elements to offend people who don't like his previous movies as revenge. To promote Postal, he released videos in which he vulgarly denounced far more successful filmmakers like Michael Bay, Eli Roth, and George Clooney, but like most trolls, this was simply an attempt to get attention. Number 5. Trail of the Pink Panther at the time of comedian Peter Sellers' death in 1980, a script for a sixth film starring him as the brilliant Inspector Jacques Clouseau was being written. While the film never went into production, that didn't stop Pink Panther series director Blake Edwards from making Trail of the Pink Panther. Most of the movie depicts a reporter trying to track down Clouseau's whereabouts after he'd been report missing, and while Sellers' death was obviously common knowledge, the trailer and other promotional material implied that Trail of the Pink Panther was a new film, perhaps one that Sellers might have finished shortly before for his death. However, as all of the footage of Sellers in Trail of the Pink Panther consists of six-year-old outtakes from the previous movies and the use of a body double, Sellers' widow was actually successful in winning a lawsuit against the studio, claiming the movie tarnished her late husband's reputation. Number 4. Friday the 13th Part 8 
Jason Takes Manhattan. After seven films mostly set in isolated rural areas, Jason Takes Manhattan promised the supernatural killer in the middle of a city of eight million people. The promotional material included images of Jason menacingly hovering over the iconic New York skyline or ripping through a poster with the familiar I Love New York logo, and the movie's trailer made it seem that the film is completely about Jason killing people in Manhattan. But unfortunately, it was not. Because at the time it was expensive to film in New York, most of the city scenes were actually filmed in Vancouver. However, to further cut expenses, almost the entirety of the film takes place on a boat ride to New York City, which actually, I'd quite like to see. Number three, The Devil Inside. There are plenty of bad horror films that disappoint audiences by promising more than they can actually deliver, but then there's The Devil Inside, a found footage piece about exorcisms that fails to deliver on almost everything it promises. For example, the most promoted image in the marketing was a possessed-looking nun with creepy eyes, but the nun appears in only seconds of the finished product and has nothing to do with the narrative at all. The worst example of baiting and not delivering, however, is how it ends. The Devil Inside climaxes with a horrific car crash that seems to be due to supernatural causes. A title card then tells the audience to go to a website for more information, and while this is clearly really stupid, only about a year after the film came out, the website was taken down. Number 2. Monty Python and the Holy Grail When Monty Python got together to do their first narrative film, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, the group had a very small budget to work with, and because of the small budget, they ran out of money to film the expensive ending that they wanted, so instead decided to end the film with a ridiculous joke on the audience. Partway through the film, a knight on horseback kills a modern historian talking about the Arthurian era. Over the course of the film, modern police are seen investigating the murder, and at the film's climax, when it builds to what appears to be an epic fight scene between King Arthur's army and the French forces occupying the castle that holds the Holy Grail, the police arrive and they're all arrested. Then it appears that the movie projector breaks and the film abruptly ends without any credits, which is surreal brilliance. Number 1. The Star Wars Special Editions Lucas loves a good fiddle. Starting in 1997, Lucas updated the original trilogy by adding new effects and new sequences. Most of these changes were poorly received, particularly the infamous Greedo shot first scene in Star Wars, where awkward CGI makes Han Solo dodge a laser blast fired at point-blank range. He continued to tweak the movies up until the Blu-ray release in 2011, where things just got petty, including changes like adding digital rocks in front of R2-D2 when Obi-Wan discovers him in Star Wars, making the Ewoks blink in Return of the Jedi, and and adding Darth Vader overdramatically yelling no when he attacks the Emperor on the Death Star, because that went down so well the first time, George! And that's our list. Make sure you subscribe to the What Culture YouTube channel for more lists like this, and don't forget to visit whatculture.com for daily news and articles. I'm Ben from What Culture, and thanks for watching.